Hey, it's Martine, and I am popping into your feed on a Sunday morning because I have something very exciting to share. The Post has a brand new podcast coming from the Opinions Desk. It's called Impromptu. And on this show, smart and insightful columnists from the opinion side sit down to talk with each other. They have these frank, thoughtful conversations on the news and on the cultural debates that we cannot stop thinking about. Their discussions are personal and candid, and they don't always agree, which is interesting. You can hear them testing their ideas and refining their thoughts and sometimes changing their minds. Listening in on some of these conversations is fascinating. And that's why I'm excited to share with you the first episode, which dropped last week. It's a discussion of something that I've been thinking about a lot. The Supreme Court's oral arguments on Tuesday in the abortion pill case. And as you'll hear, they have opinions. So here's the first episode of Impromptu. And if you like it, find it wherever you're listening to this podcast and subscribe or follow the show. We'll be back in your feeds tomorrow. Until then, have a lovely rest of your weekend. And here's Impromptu. Hi, how you guys doing? Uh, I'm great. I've been trying to get us to do this for eight years, so I'm so excited that we have a opinions podcast. Really, really seriously, eight years. Eight years. Oh my gosh! Congratulations. Yes, thank you. You, you know, had a baby. All good, all good. I did not. <laughs> yes. Well, I had that too, but longer than eight years ago. <laughs> all right. So this is a historic moment. Well, I am glad that we're here. We're going to talk about something a little bit more serious, but this won't be the last conversation we have. This is Impromptu from Washington Post Opinions, the show where you can listen in on the conversations behind the columns. We have a lot of columnists with a lot to say, so you'll hear different voices depending on what we're talking about each week. I'm Amanda Ripley, and this week in our very first episode, we are talking about a big topic, what it's like to be a woman who supports the right to an abortion in the post-Dobbs world. To discuss this, I am joined by two of my esteemed colleagues. Could you introduce yourselves? Um, Sure. Age before beauty, maybe. (laughs) Pearls Um, before swine. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Um, Dorothy Parker, right? Yes. Um, um, I'm Ruth Marcus. I am a columnist and associate editor at The Post, and I have been writing about this topic for more years than I care to admit to. I'm uh, Alexandra Petri. I write a humor column for The Post since, I guess, 20. 10, 11-ish. Awesome. And we thought, you know, abortion, humor makes sense. Although I do every so often, I, I will <laughs> sort of take off the joke hat and write a very angry column about this. So it's like, oh, yes, I, okay. I see. I, I'm sensing. So this yeah. makes sense. Yeah. OK. Next week, the Supreme Court is hearing arguments over Mifepristone, sometimes referred to as the abortion pill. It's the first time they'll take up the topic since Dobbs, the case that overturned Roe v. Wade back in June 2022, And since then, there's been a flurry of rollbacks, as we all know, to abortion rights in states and lower courts. Fourteen states have total abortion bans now. And a recent ruling in Alabama threatened the future of IVF. These changes, as we also know, have galvanized many women. Last year, a Gallup poll found only 15 percent of women thought abortion should be illegal in all cases. So let's start with the upcoming arguments over Mifepristone. Ruth, can you talk a bit about the stakes in this case? What could actually happen here? Well, what could happen and what I think will happen are probably two different things. In the what could happen part, the stakes are huge because more than half of abortions now are performed through mifepristone, a combination of two drugs, actually, and they're what's called medication abortions. So the medical procedure has become a take a series of pills procedure. You can do it in the privacy of your own home. What's at stake in the way this case has developed is not the overall availability of this medication because... While the original ruling against it would have uh, undone the the basic approval of the medication, now the way the Supreme Court has narrowed it, we're only talking about how hard it is to be able to access this medication. And so can you get it without going to a doctor's office? Can it be prescribed by somebody who's not a physician? Uh, can it be prescribed um, through 10 weeks of pregnancy as opposed to seven weeks of pregnancy. Okay, let me make sure I understand this. So you're saying that while this is an important case, 
it's probably more about how accessible the abortion pill will be as opposed to whether it will be accessible at all. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And also, while that accessibility is really important, I mean, there is a very big difference between you have to make three visits to a doctor's office and see the doctor in person in order to get this drug versus you can get it in uh, the mail or pick it up at your local pharmacy. I think that the chances that the justices are going to even, they're not going to take this drug off the market, but even the chances that they're going to roll back the availability of the medication to where it was back in 2016 are low for two quick reasons. One is that the people who are challenging it, it's a group of anti-abortion doctors, really don't have any plausible standing. It's just ludicrous to think that they have the ability to challenge the case. And even if they were found to have standing in the case, um, the notion that the court is going to interpose itself. And I hear some people who are listening to this saying, wait, have you been watching this court? And yes, I have been watching this court. But the notion that this court is going to second guess the medical decisions of the Food and Drug Administration and find that they're arbitrary and capricious, which is what they'd have to do to overturn them, is really pretty low. So stakes are high, but risk is relatively low. This is good context. Yeah, that, that's reassuring. I, yeah. I hope. Can we get that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> yes. You heard it here. For what it's worth. Why did they take it at all? They took it because there was an appeals court that ruled against the availability of the medication. Right. So they basically had to step in. Okay. And because it's very high stakes, it's really important, um, they stepped in, okay. I, I think, to correct the you may have heard about the crazy Fifth Circuit. Yeah. They stepped in to deal with the crazy Fifth Circuit. OK. OK. Um, I mean, I think back when I was at Time magazine in 20. Wait, gosh, when did this first? It was 2000, right? When in the, 2000. Yes. Yeah. We put it on the cover and we said the pill that changes everything. And it actually didn't change everything for a long time. And then slowly it got easier and easier to access. Right. And now, like you said, more than half of abortions are done this way, more than three quarters in Europe. Right. So it did eventually change everything, but it took a lot longer than we expected, as often happens with uh, in the United States with many things. Um, but I guess I just wonder, you know, in some ways, it's hard to calibrate, right? We don't know how serious each of these threats are. But since 2022, it's gotten very real and scary for a lot of men and women in the United States. And I guess I wonder, Alexandra, how are you feeling generally about the post Dobbs America? Has it changed how you look at the courts? Yeah, well, it's sort of terrifying, honestly. I'm I'm scared. I feel like it's one of those things where I know that I'm a person endowed with inalienable rights and life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I sort of was born in an era where my, just the fact that I was a person who would have like the full protection of the law and could do anything else that anyone could do was sort of, it felt like a given. And now it's like, oh, in fact, in fact, there's just going to be arbitrarily, your rights will get taken away it's almost like um, you've fallen down a very deep well and you're having to scream for help and, and in a way that you didn't expect, it sounds like. Is that right? Yeah, I think uh, not having fallen down a deep well, I can't speak to that experience yeah. from my own personal experience, <laughs> uh, but I imagine it would be like falling down a deep well. But yeah, it's just sort of the the idea that like they're sitting there like they've invented a group of like, we're certainly pediatricians and now we're going to come and insist that like we've got standing and just like for fun and a judge will very solemnly be like, absolutely, their name says they're pediatricians for sure. And if the pediatricians for sure say that this is important to do, then who cares what you and your doctor decide? Hmm. It, I don't know. It, it, yeah. It's it's chilling. It's I, like it's like ripe for satire if only it weren't true. You know, that's the thing, because as somebody whose job is to try to find out what's ridiculous about things and, and poke at it and hope that people will say, yeah, that is ridiculous. Yeah. Let's stop doing it. If a, you, a sensible person, if like if like sixty two percent of the country think actually like this is a right you should be allowed to have, like that doesn't matter. What matters is we're exercising our power, and we think that like women are something different than people, or like if you have a uterus, good luck, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay, hold that thought. After the break, we're going to get into the politics of this situation. And we're back. I do want to talk also about the politics of this. 
So far, I mean, I guess it seems like the Dobbs decision has driven more support for abortion. Uh, And so, therefore, generally for Democrats and has become a political loser, right, for Republicans. Ruth, I mean, does any of that matter? I've supposedly, theoretically, I guess, sort of allegedly the Supreme Court is supposed to be above politics, but they're still human, right? Well, (laughs) TBD, you're talking to somebody who could not have been more massively and gratifyingly wrong about the impact of Dobbs because as I started my career and watched abortion politics develop, it was always clear uh, that abortion was a very motivating force for Republican voters and not very much of a motivating force at all for Democratic voters. And then Dobbs happened. And I did not expect the beast of of angry American women and angry voters generally, but a lot of women voters, both Democrat and Republican and independent, to be energized by this. But it turns out, hello, um, completely obvious, if you take a right away from someone that they have always been told that they have through their entire adult life and you take it away— and it affects them or it affects their children or it affects their wives, they are, many of them, very unhappy about this. I spend a lot of time, because as you say, justices are people too, um, just just like embryos in test tubes. Um, that's a joke. Um, would the justices, justices like, for example, Brett Kavanaugh, have ruled if uh, the way he ruled in Dobbs, as quick maybe he would have done it eventually, but maybe not right before an election, if he realized it was going to have the political awakening, galvanizing, I think was the word that you used, effect that it turns out to have had. Um, that is a cold comfort to women in states like Texas or Alabama or Louisiana where or, or other many other places um, where abortion is unavailable. But it is... Um, giving great comfort, uh, and I think appropriately so, to Democrats who did very well with this issue in 2022 and are going to use it for all it's worth in 2024. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it is hard to predict, right? And you said, you know, yourself, you didn't predict that there would be this reaction. And so I'm guessing that uh, many of the Supreme Court justices did not predict this. Um, But I wonder, I mean, with really emotional, wicked conflicts like this, you generally get unintended reactions and unintended consequences that that are hard to predict. So we know, for example, that the number of legal abortions in the United States has stayed steady or actually slightly increased since Dobbs. So the opposite of what I think many people had hoped or feared. And it's probably right because it got easier to get abortions in many progressive states, partly because it got easier to access the abortion pill. Right. Right? Is this, that right? Yes, this goes precisely back to where we started. Um, and this is the critical thing to understand, that kind of the mailbox is the new back alley, right? In the olden, terrible olden days, when people were dying from botched illegal abortions, they had no choice but to go to, you know, physicians or God knows who else was performing abortions. Now you can find ways to obtain abortion medication, even in states where you're not supposed to be able to do it. And that changes the landscape. That is why if the question were in the Supreme Court case, it's going to be argued next week, if the question were, can this pill stay on the market, that would be revolutionary. The stakes are lower because that's not the question. I mean, I I don't want to understand date the impact of Dobbs on a, scores, hundreds, thousands of individual women who have had to travel across state lines, go through hell, uh, risk their um, health and fertility, you know, develop sepsis because doctors wouldn't perform abortions after they had miscarriages, things like that. So Dobbs has had absolutely terrible effects, but the impact of Dobbs um, numerically on the number of abortions for the reason that you said has been much less severe than it would have been if, for example, Roe had been overturned 20 years earlier Mm. when it could have been overturned Mm. but wasn't. Hmm. That's so interesting. And I mean, I guess then we should be thinking creatively, like if these rulings don't always lead to the intended outcomes, um, are there any you know, crazy, surprising, unintended twists that might come out of this ruling 
either way. I mean, we know already, I believe, that the generic manufacturer of Mifepristone has sued the FDA. Um, so the lawyers are going to get rich, it seems, <laughs> increasingly. Um, but what else might happen from this? Alexander, any imaginary, like, possible plot twists here? I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think of the things that I don't foresee will happen. And <laughs> they're, they're legion. I mean, e- even with that bump from the medication, you still have the individual situations where people who are la- later along and they've gotten bad news about. I mean, I mean there's, there's just so many stories that I feel like are getting hidden in like the bump uh, d- despite that. Because anytime like you take away a right and somebody's suddenly not able to access medical care mm. that they thought they could access, then, you know, it, it may not be like, a, a big part of a chart, but that's somebody's life that get that's getting derailed. So I, I also want right. to. I guess the consequences are still. I'm trying to think of a fun, positive consequence. Well, it doesn't even need to be yeah. positive. But if given that we are so entrenched on this conflict, right? It, it's come to symbolize a lot of things. Yeah. Wh- whatever happens, people will come up with creative, unexpected ways to resist or counterattack or undermine. Right. I think we uh, know from, that. Right. From, look from both sides. From both sides, this is what we know. Uh, Anti-abortion forces are not declaring victory with Dobbs. They're going to try to take their argument that the fetus is a human life and from the moment of conception and apply that in various places, whether it is to in vitro fertilization, whether it is to other methods of birth control. And the one thing that we do know from all of this is that the Supreme Court, which seemed to convince itself that it was getting out of the abortion regulating business is completely enmeshed in it because it's not just this Mifepristone case. There's a case out of Idaho that's coming up next month that involves what emergency rooms have to do when uh, pregnant women turn up and they were, are required to provide what the law is called stabilizing care, what happens when that conflicts with a state abortion law. So this issue is not going away from our politics. This issue is not going away from the courts. Hmm. Anything, any last thoughts of things that maybe came to you during this conversation or that you heard that were surprising in any way? Uh, I I do think going to the the contraception question, for some reason, Facebook keeps like trying to radicalize me. Like, has your Facebook feed been doing this where like it'll recommend groups to you? And mine's been recommending a group where it's it's like all about how like women are under are overestimating their market value. And they have this and like the commonly held view in the group seems to be that like, you know, the, the position of women ought to be below men and above children. And like, you know, I always wonder, how do you argue? Wait, wait, wait. wait. Facebook is recommending a to, group to, to my you? professional page. I'm like logged <laughs> on to a professional page just sitting there like posting my content, uh, you know, doing my daily work in the content minds as I'm supposed to. And I'm getting uh, it's recommending this to me. I don't know. I the algorithm, I think probably because I'm so confused that it's recommending it to me that I go and I click on it. I'm like, what is oh, this? Oh, no, you and clicked then, on it? Yeah, that that was my mistake. Because before <laughs> I just would click on like, they have a frame of a video that's badly cropped and it's like, what movie is from this? And I was like, I want to know what movie. And so uh-huh. they just think this person's an idiot. They'll click on anything. <laughs> and so, but it's fascinating because it's like if people hold in their mind just this idea that like, oh, like you, you've got a uterus, you're not a person. It's like, well, I can't argue with that. I can write a beautiful essay. I can go to your house and shake your hand. But like if you fundamentally don't see me as a human being, like you're going to take everything from me and you're going to feel like you're doing me a favor or doing society writ large a favor because society doesn't include people like myself. So hmm. anyway, hmm. Uh, it's grim. It almost sounds like you. What you're, the feeling you're describing is like the feeling of being infantilized. Yeah. Like, Women are suddenly treated like children. Yeah. Ruth, is there anything that you've heard that you're going to be taking with you or anything that you'll be watching for now when the Supreme Court hears arguments next week? Well, you said the word infantilizing, and that made me think about um, the Alabama Supreme Court, because just as Democrats should thank the U.S. Supreme Court in a weird way for Dobbs, um, they also should be thanking. I, I told the White House I thought they, that the president should be inviting the members of the Alabama Supreme Court to join him in the box at the State of the Union, because while that decision um, that fetuses were or embryos were persons from their microscopic moment of conception um, could have happened before Dobbs, it just showed the, from my point of view, craziness of the whole enterprise of declaring fetal personhood and really reminded people of the stakes here. So um, I say keep an eye on extremism because in a weird way, it's the the best friend of rationality. Hmm. Because it exposes it, just how what, what's insane. It, what, what's at stake? If we have the next, the next um, 
chapter here is making an argument for fetal personhood, which would mean not just that Texas and Alabama and Mississippi, I keep banging on them, but I'll throw in Idaho for good measure. It's not just the South. It's not just that they can deny women who are their citizens and residing there the right to abortion. It's that there is an effort and it is coming. It will not succeed, I don't think, but it is coming to make sure that people everywhere in America don't have that right. And I think that's the best way to get the right, which it should be, written back into law, not by the Supreme Court, but potentially by Congress. Mm. Wow. So you've been at once very reassuring and deeply disturbing. <laughs> and, um, and that's my congratulations. job. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank uh, you. That seems about right, though, right? That this is, yeah. this is one of many battles that a lot of women never thought they would have to re-fight. Um, but thank you both for talking about it, given the complexity. Um, we know that we don't have the answers. I guess that's sort of part of the point of this show is to kind of sit with that uncertainty. Thank you for joining us. Oh, yeah. Th- thanks for having me. Thank you so much. This was really fun. This episode was produced by Hadley Robinson. Edited by Damir Marusik, Chris Sullentrop, and Allison Michaels, and mixed by Emma Munger. Chris Rukan designed our art. Special thanks to Millie Midra and Nick Safin. Find Impromptu wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the show, please follow us, rate us, and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs>